الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى ما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويسألونك عن الروح قل الروح من أمر ربي وما أوتيتم من العلم إلا قليلا صدق الله العظيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا رب صل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم اللهم صل على محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وصل على محمد كلما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون اللهم صل على محمد وفهمني بأسرار القرآن أنب العلماء brothers and sisters listening at home Alhamdulillah today is our 35 our 35th session of doing the dress of the Quran and part 7 of Surah Al-Kahf as I mentioned last week last week we went through the key features of Surah Al-Kahf the, how many rukus there are how many ayats there are and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned different stories in Surah Al-Kahf today inshallah we'll be going through one of the questions which was posed by the mushrikeen to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a couple of sessions back, we went through the reason why Surah Al-Kahf was revealed. I'll just briefly go over. The mushrikeen, they never understood the concept of prophethood. So they wanted to verify, is this person, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is he actually a prophet? But because they didn't understand who prophets were, so how could they verify if Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a prophet? So they understood and they knew that the Jews who lived in Yathrib and later on it was named to Madinat al-Munawwara. They are the people of books. They are the people who follow Musa alayhi wa sallam. They are the people who know about prophets. So they sent Uqba ibn Mu'id and Nazir ibn Harith, two people, from Makkah al-Mukarramah to Madinah al-Munawwara, they ask the rabbis, ask the Jewish people, that if you want to verify if this person is actually a prophet, then what type of questions should we ask him? So they went, they met the rabbis in Madinah al-Munawwara, and they said that if he is actually a prophet, then ask him three questions. The first question is about soul. That what is a soul? Ask him this question. The other two questions are historical questions. Ask him, what happened to those people, to those youngsters who left their city? And the third question, ask them, ask him about what happened to that king who traveled from east to west. Ask him three questions. And the rabbis, they also told Nazir ibn Harith and, ibn, and Uqba ibn Mu'id the answers. That this is the answer which he will give. The latter two, the, the last two questions, the historical question, he'll be able to answer if he's a prophet. But the first question regarding the soul, he will not be able to answer that question. Because regarding soul, only God, meaning only Allah knows. So he will not be able to answer that question. So if he does answer the first question and he answers the second and the third question, then he is a prophet. So they came and they asked Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the three questions. And as mentioned in the Quran, as I mentioned a couple of sessions back, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "I will give you the answer tomorrow," but he didn't say, "Insha Allah." So there was a pause of fourteen to fifteen days. And Jibril alayhi salam, after two weeks, came and said to Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "That you should have said, Insha Allah." And Allah subhanahu wa taala, in in here, the whole surah al kahf was revealed, and three questions which they had posed were answered. So two of the questions, two of the historical questions which they asked about the sleepers and about the king who had traveled from east to west, those two answers are found in Surah Al-Kahf. So those who recite Surah Al-Kahf every Friday, they will go through the story of Surah Al-Kahf, the, the sleepers, and about Dhul Qarnayn. However, the first question which they asked about the soul, that is not found in Surah Al-Kahf. But that is found, and that was answered to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that is found in the surah before Surah Al-Kahf. And this is found in Surah Al-Bani Israel. The first question. 
So I will go through, because this is connected to Surah Al-Kahf, I will go through that section. The answer, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied in terms of that question. That they ask you about the soul, so what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reply? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ And they ask you about the soul. So يَسْأَلُونَكَ yes, يَسْأَلُونَ means to ask. So يَسْأَلُونَكَ means they ask you, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the soul. And this is found in the Qur'an many times. يَسْأَلُونَكَ Those who are hafiz, they will come across. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَمَنْفَالِ يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ Approximately 15 times the word يَسْأَلُونَكَ comes. And this word comes, why? Because at this moment it was, it was a mushrikeen and some other moments, the Muslims, the Sahabas, when they asked a question to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would wait for the answer to come. And when the answer would come, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reply by saying, yes, alunaka, they are asking you about this. So yes, alunaka anil anfal, they are asking you about the booty. Qul, tell them, this is the answer. So yes, alunaka comes in the Quran 15 times. Whenever, sometimes when the question were asked, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reply this way, yes, alunaka. And every time after yes, alunaka, you will find the word qul. That they ask you about this, qul, qul means say, tell them the answer. Sometimes in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't use the phrase yes, alunaka. He just tells Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qul, tell them. So for example, when they asked the question to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let's compromise. One year you worship our idols, one year we'll worship your idols. What do you say about this? We want an answer. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, yes, alunaka, they, they ask you about this. Qul, ya ayyuhal kafirun. No. Over there, just qul, ya ayyuhal kafirun. Say. And the answer was given. Uh, another occasion, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, that can you tell us the genealogy of Allah? That was a question. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, yes, alunaka, they asked this question. No. This time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just said, qul, qul huwa Allah ahad. Say Allah is one. Allah is samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakullaw kufun ahad. So, some, so 15 times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word, yes, alunaka. And other times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when ever Nabiya Karim sallallahu alayhi wa was asked a question, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would just say, qul, tell them the answer. However, Mufassirin have written a very beautiful point here. There is one occasion when a question was asked to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say qul then. I'll give you an example, just to understand this. So there's, employ- there's a company, there's a lot of employees there, and there's a manager. And on top of the manager, there's a CEO. Okay? So whenever the employees, they, ha- they have a question, they ask the manager. And the manager then goes and asks the CEO. So the CEO of the company will give the answer. So he gives the answer to the manager, and the manager will give the answer to the employees. However, at one day, a time comes when the employee, they ask such an amazing question. That they ask the manager, the manager asks the CEO. The CEO says, this is such an amazing question, that I don't want you to say the answer to them. I will answer. I will answer directly to them. So this one part, one passage of the Quran is like that. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers. And that is in second para. Where, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي The old Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي When my servant ask you about me. When my servant ask you about me. So it should have been, it should have been فَقُول Tell them. Inni qarib, I am very near. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي When my servant asks about me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself replies, فَإِنِّي قَرِيب I am near. This shows the honor which this ummah has got. The honor this ummah has got, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to this ummah, that my love for this ummah is such, that I am very close to you. Now closeness can, can have different meanings. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thereafter then elaborates that when I say closeness, what does he mean? One meaning. One meaning is Ujibu da'a da'an that I reply and I answer Ujibu, I reply. Ujibu means I reply. Da'wata da'i. 
when a caller makes a supplication, إِذَا دَعَان When he makes, إِذَا دَعَان When he makes a supplication, I accept his dua. So this is one of the, uh, the love which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for this ummah. That he has kept this door open for us. That whenever we will make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is qareeb, he is near. And he will answer whenever we will ask him. This is why Mufassirin have written here, أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will answer whenever a caller calls me. He didn't say, he didn't give the, uh, uh, the, the etiquette of the caller. He didn't say that this, this caller needs to have the, these qualities inside him. He needs to be pious. He needs to be, no. A caller can be anyone. When you phone 999, they don't ask you, are you a fraudster, are you this, are you this? No, he's a caller. So whenever you will call, they will answer. Similarly, whenever a caller will, uh, will call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will answer. The only condition is, إِذَا دَعَانَ that you have to make dua. You have to take that step. Ida da'an, meaning you make dua, then Allah SWT will definitely accept your dua. That's the only condition. This is why, whenever we want to make dua, shaitan will tell us, and shaitan will stop us making dua. Because shaitan knows, as, as long as you are making dua, he will keep on accepting that dua. This is why, a, a scholar was asked, Ghaliban, it was Hazrat Umar, I can't remember. A scholar was asked, that, what's the sign? What's the sign that when I make dua, that my dua is accepted? What's the sign? Is there a sign that when I make dua, that dua is accepted? You know what the scholar replied? The fact, the fact that you are making a dua is a sign that your dua is accepted. Because he is the one who is telling you to make dua. And he will only tell you to make dua if he wants to accept your dua. So, إِذَا دَعَان Always make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reply. No matter how many, how many, لَوْ بَلَغَتْ ذُنُوبُكَ عَنَانَ السَّمَاءِ That if your sins were to reach the skies, ثُمَّ اسْتَغْفَرْتَنِي And you were to ask forgiveness, غَفَرْتُ I will forgive your sins. There's only one sin which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَن يُشْرَكْ the, the, the sin of associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Besides that, any meaning over here means that even a person who associates, if he, if he becomes Muslim, his sins are forgiven. Meaning, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the capability of accepting everyone's dua. Even in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept anyone's dua. The only condition is, إِذَا دعان. You have to, we have to take that first step of asking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ They ask you, O oh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they ask you this question. What question do they ask? عَنِ ruh About soul. Like I mentioned, in the Quran 15 times, يَسْأَلُونَكَ comes, and many other times, قُلْ comes. And if you were to open up the books of Ahadith, you will find the Sahabas, one thing they weren't shy with, was asking questions to Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, they had reverence to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They respected Prophet so much that the likes of Amr bin As says that if you look at the reverence they had for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Amr bin As says, if you were to ask me to describe Nabi Karim sallallahu I will not be able to describe him. Because of the sheer awe of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I will not. But the Sahabas, when it came to questioning, they would question Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The young one would ask, the elders would ask. And everyone in the society, in the locality of Medina al Munawwara, whatever question they asked, they had. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would answer their question. Young, old. Sometimes he would give them uh, analogies. Sometimes he would draw on the floor the, uh, the answers. And different ways, different methods were used. And this... Ghaliman Sheikh Abu Fattah al Ghuda, he has written a book, Nabiya Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a teacher. And in there he writes that one of the ways Nabiya Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught the Sahabas was through questioning. If the Sahabas didn't have any questions, then he would make questions up. Who is a bankrupt person? Who is this? And like in question and answers, so much, even Hadith of Jibreel is, about, is all about question and answer. So it's very important that we. 
we use this method. You know, last week I was, those who were present last week, I mentioned that this is a time when our children will be going through the state school and they'll be learning the, sto- the story of Isa alayhi salatu the different version. So it's our responsibility that, that if you don't want to listen and if you don't want to uh, go through the whole story with our children, then ask them questions. Engage from the questioning. That have they got the right belief of Isa a.s.? If they haven't, then teach them the right belief of Isa a.s. Because they are bombarded so much at this moment of time that sometimes, sometimes they start believing in the other version, which is not true, which goes against Qur'an. So it's very important that we use this methodology of asking questions with our children to ascertain what knowledge they have of Isa a.s. And if they've got the wrong knowledge, then we give them the right knowledge. So this is very important. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ And they ask you about the soul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْ O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell them, الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ Rabbi. That soul is a matter of my Lord. That's it. Full stop. The answer to this question is, أَمْرِ Rabbi. It is the matter of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it, nothing more. This is why, and that's it. That's the answer. And they said, the Jews had said, that Nabi Karim will not be able to answer this question because no one knows about soul. So this is a soul. However, however, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his ahadith, has told us few things about soul to make us understand what soul is. So what Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in the ahadith, I will just mention that. Again, if you don't understand, it's okay. Because this is not something which we, don't, we need to understand. But because Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned few things about soul. So I thought I'll go through the, the aspect of soul that next week inshallah will Start Surah Al-Kahf. So what is the soul? So soul in Arabic, as Quran says, ar-ruh, ar-ruh, is the, is the element which keeps us alive. You see, when you ask someone, the what keeps our body alive? Someone might say it's the, it's the heartbeat. But it's not the heartbeat which is keeping us alive. There's something behind the heartbeat which is keeping our body alive. And that is the soul. If you ask someone, that clock is running. How do you know that clock is running? It will say because the, the hand is moving. No, that's not the right answer. Yes, the hand is moving, it's showing us that the clock is running. But the clock has got a battery behind. If you take that battery, the whole clock will stop working. Similarly, our body is working. And the sign is that our heart is beating. But behind that, there's an element which is making this body work. And what is that? That is the soul. Once you take the soul away, the whole body remains the same, but it will not function. This is what's the difference between an alive person and a dead person. An alive person will have the soul. The dead person does not have the soul. The soul keeps us alive. And the soul is the main thing of the body. The soul is the main thing of the body. That, that is what, is, what it, it is keeping us alive. So this soul, this soul, which cannot have... And no one will be able to paint a picture of the soul. How a soul looks like. But it's within everyone. That's why we are alive. This soul was actually, before, it was, before we were created, before anyone was created, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had gathered all the souls in alam arwah alam arwah That's where all the souls were gathered. And it's the soul... It's the soul which is making the journey. The soul is making the journey from Alim Arwah to this world. From this world to Barzakh. From Barzakh to the Day of Judgment. That's why when someone passes away, when someone passes away, what do we say? We say that this person has passed away. This, uh, this person ka intiqal ho gaya. This person ka in, uh, intiqal. What does intiqal mean? Intiqal means move. Intiqal, intiqal, intiqal. Intiqal means moving from one place to another place. So that soul, which was in this world, 
now it's gone from, from this world to the next. Now the next main time for the soul is the day of judgment. But for the day of judgment, there's time to come. There's, there's a time for the day of judgment to come. So between the day of judgment and this world, there's a barrier. There's a barrier. This transition, this barrier is called barzakh. So when a person passes away, the soul goes into the barzakh. That, that time frame is called barzakh. That's why it's called a barrier, because it's a barrier between the day of judgment and this world. So the soul, when alam arwah the original soul, the original soul, okay, our souls were created according to Quran and Karim commentary with Akhada Rabbuka min Bani Adam min Zuhurim. Everyone's soul was created from the, from the backbone of Adam alayhi salam. But the soul of Adam alayhi salam was created, was, was the, was the Amr, was the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Adam alayhi salam was created, okay, when Adam alayhi salam was created, he was, when, initially when he was, he was created, he was just a hollow person. He was dead. He was hollow. This is why the angels were able to see this person. But he was hollow. This is why Iblis was able to go through him. Okay? The day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blew the soul. Now this is directly from Allah. To Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. Adam alayhi salam became alive. It comes in hadith. That as the soul entered Adam alayhi salam from his head. Okay, it came down, it came down, it came down. And as it's coming down, all the features from the head started becoming alive. And in one narration, it is stated that when it reached the nose of Adam Islam, Adam Islam actually sneezed. Okay, and, and, and when the soul was put into Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels, O oh, angels, prostrate in front of him. So that origin, so. Our souls were created from the backbone of Adam. So our souls were created uh, were in Alam Arwah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Alam Arwah okay, made a covenant, asked us this question. That, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And everyone, everyone who's going, who, uh, who's going to come, who are alive, who will come later on, replied, Bala, yes. This is why scholars have mentioned that when a person when a person is born, he is born on fitra, on nature. That's why when a person is born, he is born as a Muslim. This is why it comes in narration that if a person, even if he is born in a non-Muslim family and he dies under the age of puberty, that in one narration he will enter Jannah and one narration he will enter uh, an area between Jannah and Jahannam Araf. Because, before, because he is still a Muslim at that age, under the age of puberty. That's why I mentioned last time that when a person becomes a Muslim, okay, usually he should be referred as river. Because he was a Muslim before. He's, he's going back to, then he became another, uh, he followed another religion, now he's going back to Islam. So our souls were kept in Alam Arwah. Then, obviously this, this, the cycle of uh, birth, whenever the cycle of birth happens, after four months, okay, uh, we all know uh, from embryo, it, it turns into a fetus. When the fetus is about 120 days, in a mother's womb, okay, from alam arwah the soul is taken, okay, from that alam now, and put into this alam, okay, into the mother's womb, at four months, 120 days. So before that, the baby, okay, is, does it have a soul? He's not alive. At that time, technically, he is now classed as alive. He's, the, he's got the soul. So now, when this baby comes out, we, we, as humans, we are element of two things. We've got the earthly, earthly body, okay, earthly, and we've got the soul. The soul is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and the other part is from the earth. That's why when a person will pass away, Whatever is from the earth, it will go back into the earth. And that soul is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when, when the, the, the ghiza, the, the, the nourishment of our body comes from 
the food from which is here. To sustain life, to sustain this, this human being, okay, our nourishment comes from the earthly things. But our nourishment for the soul is from Allah. So the nourishment of the soul comes from Quran. The, from these things. So by doing good actions, you are nourishing the soul. And by food, you are nourishing this body. Then a time comes when he, when, okay, now, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then says, that, then a time comes when a person passes away. So we are of two elements. We've got soul and we've got the body. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once said, he was sat with the sahabas, that when a person is about to pass away, okay, and I just mentioned uh, when a good person passes away, okay, because there's the other hadith when the bad person passes away. When a, per- when a good person passes away, and he's about to pass away. Okay? So there's a couple of minutes left or seconds left. Okay? Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith that the whole room gets filled with angels. Now, there's angels here, but we can't see. There's angels. We can't see. But at that moment, at that moment, okay, it is mentioned that the person who is passing away, he is able to see the angels. Sometimes they are able to see the angel. This is why you will have heard some people at the time of passing away, they're saying, come here, come, come close, come, come. Who are they talking to? There's no one there. Or there's only family. Who else are they talking to? So the whole room gets filled with angels when they are passing away. And then Israel comes. Now Israel, he's the person who's in charge of taking soul. Not soul. Okay, this is why it comes in a book that once Israel asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I'm in charge of taking the soul, then people are going to talk bad about me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it comes in books, kitab, that I will create signs. That they will not blame you, but they will blame illness. They will blame something will happen to them. And they will say, he, will, he died because of that illness. He died because of... But at the end of the day, okay, it's Israel alayhi salam who's taking that. This is why some people just pass away without happening anything. Because whenever the time comes, Israel alayhi salam will take that soul away. So the whole room is, is filled now okay, with angels. And Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa says, then the angel comes. If it's a good person, then just like you pour water, so easy. That's how easily he will take the soul out. And because, remember this, this is a soul which you've been working for so many years. So, just like this body will be shrouded, it comes in hadith, the angel shroud this soul. And that soul is then taken up to the first heaven, to the second heaven. To the third. So when the soul is taken up, we're dead. We're gone. So we don't have any soul at that time. People will shroud us. People will uh, 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 do the arrangements. Okay, uh, they'll read janazah, and the soul is up first, seven, second, third, four, fifth, six, seven, and then and then it will meet Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala speaks to the soul, and if it's from the illiyin, okay, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will give the glad tidings, and then when this person is put into the grave. This person is put into the grave. That's when the soul now comes back down to the body. Now how? Now soul is inside me. Okay, is inside everyone. How this soul now comes back into the body? Only Allah knows. But there's a connection between the soul and the body at that time. So when a person is buried and the soul is put into into that body, okay. And we've read our, uh, 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 our dua, uh, uh, the Alif Lam Mim and Amin Rasul and the Dua. This is the time when Nabi Karim said in a hadith, the Munkar and Nakir comes and says, sit up. And they ask three questions. Marabuka, uh, Madinuka, uh, uh, who is your Lord? What religion did you refer on? What do you say about Nabi Karim? And at that time, it will not be our tongue we will speak. A lot of people think, it's easy, this question. No. What, what's in the soul, what's in the... That will speak. And if the answer is correct, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
give us the ability to give the right answer. If the answer is correct, the angel Mulkan and Nakir will give glad tidings to the person and he will be told that you can go to sleep, the windows of uh, uh, Jannah will be open for you and you sleep. So this time is called alam e barzakh now. He is in alam e barzakh So those who have passed away, they're in alam e barzakh Their connection, their, the bodily connection and the soul connection, only Allah knows how they are connected. But they, if they've done good, they are, they are reaping the reward and if they've done bad, they are getting punished. This is one of the beliefs which we, had, which we have. That when a person passes away, he gets punished. You know, if someone is sleeping next to me, okay, he wakes up, okay, I just had a really bad dream, okay, and he starts sweating. I can't say, no, you're lying. You're just saying next to me, nothing happened to you. Because his experience is different to my experience. This connection of the punishment of the hereafter, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how it happens. But this is one of, the, one of our beliefs that it will happen. And then Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when the soul is put, he will know. Could you believe it? This is how much sensory he, he will be given, that person who, who has passed away, that soil is being put in, on top of him and he'll be able to hear the footsteps. That's why it comes in, uh, uh, one of the sahaba, uh, sahabi said that when a person uh, 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 buries someone, they stay there. After making dua, you know, after making dua, alhamdulillah, we've seen here as well, after making dua, stay there. Why? Why stay there after making dua? The, uh, the last thing you do is dua, and then you should leave. Why stay there? Because this sahabi says, because now he's now being questioned, and he knows you are there, and he, he'll be able to hear the footsteps. So in one, in one duration, until a uh, 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 camel is slaughtered, that duration stay there. And then go. And then it's, it's me or whoever has passed away and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then nothing's gonna work. If you've done bad, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us. And then this world which we are living in, which we are here, will keep on running and will be there six foot under. But when we're there, it'll be too late. So this is a time to make that difference. This is the time when, as I said, he will not tell us when he's coming. So many we met who said, I'll see you tomorrow. So these are the things which... And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the day of judgment, this soul, okay, when the body will perish. So when the body perishes, one... Uh, ajaf, so the, the base spine, okay, remains. Everyone's base spine remains. Everyone's. So when the day of judgment will come, from that base spine, it's about one inch, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will recreate us again. But with a body which is going to be everlasting. This is why with this temporary no- body, we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With this temporary knowledge, we cannot understand the faculty of ruh. We cannot understand because this is temporary knowledge. But then you have the knowledge. But then afterwards the soul and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create, will give the body. And that, with that body, that body, when the soul enters that body, then that soul will never come out. It will either enter Jannah, it will either enter Jahannam. And that body will be so powerful that with that body he'll be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Jannah. Not with this body, with this temporary body. So, one of the key elements which I wanted to share was, let's all, every time remember death. Every time. Because Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that, أكثر وهازم من لذات أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام They keep on remembering death. The other day this youngster was asking me, that what's the easiest way of, of staying away from sin? I said, what Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, keep on remembering death. If you remember death, explicitly, what will happen, what's going to happen, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy. So I thought, I was going to re- recite a nasheed, but I thought, 
instead of me reciting them. This is a nasheed which when I was really young, I used to listen to this nasheed a lot. And alhamdulillah, I managed to find the, the nasheed. And I thought because it goes beautiful and it goes with this theme, I thought I'll play that nasheed so that the whole purpose of doing the rest of the Qur'an is so that we change our life. And we start preparing. That before that time comes, we prepare. So I thought I'll put the, uh, the nasheed and inshallah we can conclude. And next week, inshallah we will start with uh, Surah Al-Kahf. So this is the nasheed we thought, which I thought I'll play. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. If, everyone, if anyone wants to close their eyes, they can. But just remember, this is in Urdu. Bismillah ar-Rahman.
this is haqiqat that one day we will have to all face this so before the time comes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the opportunity to change our ways so that we connect ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so with these words I will conclude today's session today is Friday Islamically so brothers and sisters at home I requested to recite Duru Sharif abundantly upon Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam subhanallah wa bihamdik subhanakallah wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk